In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be, please be seated. Well, it's been quite a week. This time last week, I was in the uh, chapel of Trinity College in Dublin, where we had uh, worship there. And after that, they had a little reception. They don't call it coffee hour, and there's a reason there was no coffee there. They had port and tea, but mostly port. And when I explained to them that we would never have that, but we would have coffee, the uh, vicar there said, what a barbaric country you are. <laughs> Having said that, it really is wonderful to be back, and I prefer the coffee. Still, it has been a tremendously busy week at St. James this week. Right. The day I got back, we had a vestry meeting. Then we had a new monthly service at the Hyde Park Assisted Living Center. And then we had the inauguration of this year's Reading Adventures program at uh, North Park Elementary. And then we had the Regional Council's Executive Committee meeting with uh, its new member from St. James, Deb Belding. <coughs> And just yesterday, what a day. Yesterday morning, we had the men's group followed almost immediately by a funeral, followed by uh, our participation in the 200th anniversary of St. Paul's in Tivoli, followed immediately by the final graveyard tours of the season. Wow. This afternoon, the youth group will be raking leaves. And tomorrow, we observe the feast day of St. James, our patron. So it's no exaggeration to say that we are an involved church. And I have to also say, I owe a debt of thanks to all of those who work so hard to make St. James a light upon the hill. That's part of what these pictures you see on the walls are all about. And there are new pictures in the parish hall, and there will be new pictures appearing throughout the weeks. They are a way of recognizing how we live our faith, both outwardly and inwardly. Oh, and I forgot, this Thursday we, we started the new study of the Gospel of Thomas, which you probably may not even, even heard of. So there's a lot going on. Anyway. All of this activity and the fact that, yes, today begins our stewardship season does beg the question, what do we owe God? Do we owe God our time, our talent, our treasure? You know those three. And how much do we owe? That's what today's gospel has been all about and is uniquely suited to address that question. What do we owe? You see, the trap, and you probably figured out by reading it, that it was a trap that was set by the Pharisees and the Herodians was designed all around the one question. What do we owe to the emperor versus what we owe to God? There are other questions that we can ask that come out of that one question. For example, what do we owe ourselves? What do we owe our posterity? What do we owe our society? What do we owe our economy? But in the gospel, these are all reduced down to those two options. What do we owe the emperor? And what do we owe God? Now, I don't know if you're familiar with who the Herodians are in the gospel, but they are a very unlikely colluding, uh, colluding group with the Pharisees because they hated each other. The Pharisees were all about obeying the law of the Jews, absolutely following it faithfully. The Herodians, on the other hand, would be what you might call collaborators. They worked with the Romans. They were very interested in keeping the Romans happy at all times. So the Pharisees hated both the Romans 
and the Herodians with every fiber of their being. But they hated somebody else more. They hated and feared Jesus enough to come together. Besides, they thought that together they had the perfect trap. You see, what they did was they publicly asked Jesus where the Jews should pay the Roman tax. And in doing that, they had really put him in a corner. Because if he answered yes, yes, they should pay the tax, then the Pharisees, right then and there, in the court of the temple, remember that, that's where they are, they're in the court of the temple. And if he said, yes, you should pay the tax, then they would publicly condemn him in front of everyone, and the likelihood is his disciples would reject him. But if Jesus said, no, you should not pay the tax to the Romans, which is what the Pharisees believed, then the Herodians would condemn him publicly, and with all, in all likelihood, he would be arrested by the Romans. Perfect trap. Of course, Jesus was ready for them. So he asked for the coin for the tax. Now here's a little interesting little tidbit here. They're in the court of the of the uh, they're in the court of the temple, in the courtyard, right? Where no graven image is allowed to be. This is the same court where just the day before Jesus had overturned the money changers' tables because they had turned his father's house into a marketplace. Remember that? Same place next day. And so Jesus says to them, show me the coin for the tax. And we don't know who it is, probably one of the Herodians. They pull out a denarius. And whose picture's on the denarius? Caesar. They say, Jesus says, okay, whose picture? They say Caesar. And he says, good, then render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God what is God's. And that's the end of it. They have no answer for him. Because what he has done, in essence, has just told them that they have to decide for themselves what they owe to God versus the emperor. They have to decide how much they owe to God. They have to decide where they place their allegiance they have to decide for themselves where their hearts lie and what they value. Is it God? Or is it the things of this world? And that's the question that's facing us every day. What do we owe to God versus all of the other emperors of our lives? Our possessions, our homes, our jobs, our families, all those things, our sports. By the way, sorry Yankees fans. It is an apt question in this stewardship season. After all, what is stewardship if it's not using the resources that God gives us to further God's kingdom of love on earth? What else is stewardship? What is stewardship if it is not caring for that which God has placed before us? Whether it be people, places, or things. That's what we strive to do at St. James. To further the realm of God using the resources that God gives us. Those resources are made up of both things and people. This building the parish house, our graveyard, these are resources that God has put in our trust. And all the wonderful people who work so hard here, who worship here to show and, and share God's love. None of these things, the things or the people, none of them is perfect. 
things fall apart. They smell. There are holes in places where there shouldn't be. And frankly, you could say the same about most of us. But neither people nor places have to be perfect for God to use them. And this church has been superb. It has been a superb place for God's presence to be made known for more than 200 years. In fact, 206 years just last week. Now, the ancient Celts, you know I had to bring up the Celts because I just came back from Ireland. The ancient Celts had a phrase that could describe a place like St. James. They would call us a thin place. It is a place where the veil between the physical world and the world of God, the spiritual world, was so thin that there is communion between the two, where the two can come together. That's what this place is, where the divine is more easily made known to the world. God is everywhere. But at a place like St. James, you can feel it a little bit more. That's one of the great values of having a church building, a place where the doors are open and people can come in and sit and pray. This is a place where we open the broader world of God's presence to those who are trapped in the world of the emperor. Those pictures on the wall, they show how we breach that veil, how we connect the world to the realm of God. We are the reminder that God is everywhere, with us always and to the end of time. That is who we are. And yes, this work does require things like buildings and staff and by golly, even taxes that we pay to the state. That's what it takes so that we can make available space for people to encounter God's love. And I'd argue it's worth it. And I would argue that that is what we owe to God. And we do what it takes to fulfill that obligation. Sure, everybody has competing interests. We all have our own taxes, our own housing, our own food to deal with, our own entertainments. And yeah, God doesn't begrudge us our entertainments, assuming they're pretty healthy. But as we approach all these other considerations of what we owe and whom we owe, think about what Jesus, with those folks trying to trap him, Think about him. What was it he said that stumped them so completely? Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God. There's a catch in that statement, though. Something that we all know in our hearts just as you, that they all knew in their hearts just as you know it in your hearts. And that is, that everything is God's. All belongs to God. In the coming weeks, as you consider your pledges, consider those Pharisees and Herodians. Consider what belongs to the world and what belongs to God. And we may, when we offer our pledges in November, lift them up to God with the words that we use when we receive the blessings every Sunday as we say, all things come of thee, O Lord. And of thine own have we given thee. Amen.